Hi, I'm Dr. Gil Welch. In this short take, we'll investigate 95% confidence interval. I know that sounds kind of tedious or maybe a little intimidating. But today the focus is on understanding what 95% confidence intervals mean, not where they come from. Are you still driving a gas-guzzling internal combustion engine? I know I am. Shouldn't you move up to a hybrid? Why do we think that's a good thing? Because the internal combustion engine uses one source of energy, gasoline, while a hybrid can make use of another source of energy, the energy that comes from braking in the vehicle. Here's the analogous question in statistics. Are you still interpreting p-values? Shouldn't you move up to a 95% confidence interval? The p-value is just one piece of information. The confidence interval provides two pieces of information. In our last video, I encouraged you to translate fancy words. I suggested that a p-value was best thought of as simply the role of chance. And the phrase statistically significant could be translated to unlikely to be due to chance. Here's a new phrase, 95% confidence interval. I'd like you to think about that as the margin of error. Let's return to our study of finasteride versus placebo. We follow patients after giving some the drug, others not, and then we measure the change in PSA. That's the prostate-specific antigen. It's just a continuous variable. In the finasteride group, it goes up one point. In the placebo group, it goes up three points. We calculate the effect size and say, on average, the PSA of patients taking finasteride rose two points less than those taking placebo. Now, we know that two points is an estimate. The question is, how precise is the estimate? Here's what it will look like. On average, the PSA of patients taking finasteride rose two points less than those taking placebo. 95% CI, one, two, three. Interpretation? Think about the margin of error. Somewhere between one and three points less is how much the finasteride group benefits. We like to visualize 95% CIs. And they're typically drawn this way. The reported effect size is shown as a box. Two points less. That was the main estimate from the study. But there's a margin of error. There's a lower bound to that margin and an upper bound. The lower bound is one point less. The upper bound is three points less. And the truth is somewhere in this range. So let's define the term 95% confidence interval. The formal definition is this. A range of values computed from the sample data which, were the study repeated multiple times, would contain the unknown parameter, that's what we're interested in, 95% of the time. Now the working definition is 95% of the time the truth is in this range. 95% confidence intervals involve two numbers, and the truth is likely somewhere in between. Here's another view of the 95% confidence interval. Let's come back to our working definition. 95% of the time, the truth is in this range. So here's the truth. We don't know what it is. We just know it's out there. Here's a study. You can see what the primary finding is, that's in the box. And you can see the confidence interval on either side of the box. And you can see that the confidence interval, in fact, includes the truth. Here's another study. Now, we didn't get quite as close to truth this time, but still, it's in the 95% confidence interval. Now we're doing the study 100 times. Most of the time, the truth is in the confidence interval of the studies. But you can see those red lines, those red confidence intervals with double X's next to them, are five studies that did not include the truth. 
So the truth won't always be in the confidence interval, but most of the time it will be. So now you try this. Patients in the control group required more cataract surgery than those in the intervention group. 15 versus 8 percent. 95 percent CI for the 7 percent absolute increase. If you're not familiar with absolute increase, that's simply 15 percent minus 8 percent. The 95 percent CI for it is somewhere between 2 and 12 percent. It's always easy to address this question, what is the range of plausible effect sizes, by drawing a picture. The reported effect size, it's a 7% absolute increase. But there's some margin of error. The lower bound is a 2% absolute increase. The upper bound is a 12% absolute increase. Here's another one. Patients taking Maxol had a higher risk of developing colonic adenomas than patients in the placebo group. Relative risk of 1.4, 95% CI, 0.8 to 2.4. Let's draw it. The reported effect size is a relative risk of 1.4. But there's some margin of error. The lower bound is 0.8. The upper bound is 2.4. That's a wide range. Why? Well, no difference between the two groups would be a relative risk of one, where the risk of developing colonic adenomas was equal in the Maxol and the placebo group. So, what is the plausible effect of Maxol on colonic adenomas? Well, it may produce higher risk, but it may also be associated with lower risk. We just don't know. That's a wide confidence interval. One more. On average, the PSA of patients taking finasteride rose two points less than those taking placebo. In this example, the 95% CI goes from, catch that, negative 1 to positive 5. Again, it helps to draw it. The reported effect size, it's two points less. But there's a margin of error. The lower bound, it's one point more. That's the negative. The upper bound is five points less. Again, this crosses the no difference line, because here no difference is zero. What's the plausible effect of finasteride? Well, it may lead to a slower rise in PSA, but it may also lead to a faster rise. We're just not sure. So here are the things you should know about 95% confidence intervals. In all studies, the observed effect size is only an estimate of the truth. The 95% confidence interval is the range of values around the effect size that will contain the truth 95% of the time. A narrow confidence interval means we're pretty sure where the truth is. A wide confidence interval means we are not. Now, in the next video, I'll offer a couple of advanced points about confidence intervals, because there's a lot of information in them. But before we end, I just want to talk about the relationship between 95% confidence intervals and p-values. If the p-value is greater than 5%, then the 95% confidence interval should include no difference between the two groups. So here's a confidence interval. Here's no difference between the two groups. That study is going to have a p-value greater than 5%. And it could be look like this again. The effect size is on the other side, but the confidence interval includes no difference. The p-value will be greater than 5%. If the p-value is less than 5%, then the 95% confidence interval should not include no difference between the two groups. It might be over here, or it might be over here, but it doesn't include no difference between the two groups. So, p-values have one piece of information. It's the probability that the observed result is due to chance. 95% confidence intervals, on the other hand, have two pieces of information. It tells you the probability that the observed result is due to chance, but it also tells you the range of plausible effect sizes 
given what was observed. I hope this helps.